Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to College Talk Summer Series. It's Tuesday, July 14th. I'm starting to see the participants rolling in. Sometimes it takes them a few minutes. So we'll give them a little bit of time to start clicking in. What time is it? Yeah, we're on time. Exactly 11.30. There we go. A couple more. Here they come. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get started as you guys start to roll in. Um, today I'm really excited about um, our three um, schools that are presenting. We have the University of Arizona, Reed College, and Montana State University. Um, and they are going to be telling us all about their universities and the changes that have occurred and if there's anything that you guys need to know about for the class of 2021. Um, they're also going to tell us anything about um, the current situation and what that looks like and any of your questions that you have um, that you need answered. They will, um, we will do that at the end. So as usual. Um, the little Q&A box with the little chat boxes is where you're going to put your questions and we're going to answer them at the end. That way everyone has the ability to go through um, their presentation and then we will spend as much time as we need to at the end to answer your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce everyone. Um, we should all be on screen right now. You should be able to see all of us. Um, so first, um, from the University of Arizona, I have Molly Ingram. Um, she is a, reg a, a regional admissions counselor for the University of Arizona based in the Bay Area. So she's here in California. Born and raised in Sacramento, California, Molly graduated summa cum laude from UC Davis with a bachelor's degree in history before attending the University of Oregon for graduate school. Molly currently serves as a communications chair for the Regional Admissions Counselors of California, also known as RAC and loves working with California students who seek educational opportunities out of state. And RAC was actually a great resource for me um, when I was putting together uh, this college talk series. There were so many of the reps that came front, um, forward and um, uh, uh, agreed to be part of the series. So thank you, Molly. Next, we have Milian. And Milian, you're going to have to help me with where you grew up. How do you say that in Oklahoma? Okmulgee, Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Oh, Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Okay. He moved north during grade school to Minneapolis, Minnesota and graduated from Theodore Roosevelt High School. He attended St. Olaf College, um, completing a BA with majors in psychology, communications, and theater. He's held roles in higher education, including as director and dean at various institutions. His enrollment experience includes his alma mater, which is St. Olaf, the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Hamlin University, also in St. Paul. Millian um, received an MA in Leadership of Student Affairs from the University of St. Thomas, and he currently leads the Admissions and Financial Aid Office at Reed College. Millian, thank you so much for joining us today. And last but not least, we have um, Max, and is it hamburger? said just like a hamburger you eat. All right, that's awesome. All right, so Max Hamburger is currently in his fifth year as the admissions counselor at Montana State University. Max graduated from MSU in the spring of 2015 with a BA in film and photography. Along the way, he was a campus tour guide, an orientation leader, and he was involved in many student clubs and activities. Max grew up on the other side of the country in Buffalo, New York and chose MSU because of the beautiful location and access to amazing academic opportunities. Now, as an admissions counselor, he has the opportunity to help other students discover MSU and find their new home. So, I am so excited to hear from all of you today. So Molly, we're gonna go with you first. Are you ready? I'm gonna go, and then I'm gonna go off screen um, and, uh, let me go off screen first. We're, we're, I'm going to go off screen. I'm going to mute myself and um, be off screen so that way we won't interrupt Molly when she. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Molly Ingram. I'm so excited to talk to you about the University of Arizona today. And if I can just get this slide to 
There we go. Um, so the University of Arizona, just to kind of give you a background about what's happening right now on campus um, and what had happened when the pandemic began. Um, the University of Arizona, we are very committed to being flexible for our students. Um, so for students who were enrolled in classes, uh, we did give them the option to do pass, no pass grading. Um, and they had that option up until the end of the semester because we know this has been a very stressful time for students. Um, for all, all of you out there who are watching, if you do have pass, no pass grades um, on your transcript, do not worry about that. The university will accept any kind of grading system uh, that your school has used due to the situation. Um, and moving forward, another thing to consider, the University of Arizona, we are planning to return in person, but we also recognize that not all of our students feel comfortable being on campus. Uh, so we will have a variety of options for fall this year, including uh, fully online hybrid courses, as well as in person. And if you want more information and keeping up to date with what's going on with our COVID-19 situation, um, we do have an information page and you can also check out out the uh, University of Arizona President's website. Um, so now I will get started in talking about Arizona's first university. So here you can see a picture of Old Main, which is the very first building that we had on campus when Arizona was founded um, as the first university before Arizona was officially a state. Back then we only had three students on campus and this building is still on campus today and serves as the main admissions building. So if you come to campus in the future to go on a tour, this is the building that you would come to. And not only are we Arizona's oldest university, but we are Arizona's only Best Buy university. So we are considered to provide a very good quality education for the cost. Now, the campus itself is one square mile. And if you've never seen campus before, we do have a virtual tour that you can take and it will give you a much better view of the pictures that you'll see in this presentation. So I highly recommend you check it out. And on that one square mile campus, we do have students from all 50 states, as well as 122 different countries uh, that comprise approximately 35,000 undergraduate students. Uh, the majority of our students are from the state of Arizona, but we do have students um, very much so from California, about 5,000 of our 35,000 undergraduates are from California. So you'll meet people from the Bay Area, from SoCal, all over the state, as well as all over the world, which makes for a really great college experience. Um, and despite the fact that we do have a very large student body in comparison to some other universities, our student to faculty ratio is 15 to one. So we do have quite a few professors um, on campus to accommodate our large student body size. Um, in terms of programs, so we have over 300 plus degree programs to choose from. Uh, when I say 300 plus, I'm referring to any undergraduate degree, graduate, as well as postgraduate work, and that can include majors and minors. Um, but the five programs that we're most well known for are architecture, engineering, which we have 15 different kinds of, nursing, uh, the business school and the College of Fine Arts. And the College of Fine Arts includes things like music, uh, dance, musical theater. Um, fun fact, we are the second best in the country for dance uh, past Juilliard. Um, so if you want to learn more about all the different degree programs that we have, those are available on our website for you to peruse. Um, moving on. So we want our students to, obviously we want you to major in something that you're interested in and have that very strong foundational background in the classroom, but we want our students to graduate with a skill set for jobs that might not even exist yet. Uh, when I was in high school, Facebook was brand new and I had no idea that my friends would go on to have jobs at tech companies like Facebook and Instagram. So when you are done with college, there might be something out there that you want to start and we want to make sure that our students have hands on experience that will prepare them for the real world after college. Um, and so our students, they are very active in campus clubs and organizations, as well as internship opportunities, uh, because the University of Arizona does have a program called the 100% Engagement Initiative, uh, which basically means that we want 100% of our students to graduate having had some internship opportunity, research opportunity, maybe you're working in a lab on campus with a professor, a study abroad, which we have over 200 different programs for, as well as interning abroad. 
um, our business school, they have partnerships with companies in Shanghai and London and Tokyo. So some of our students, they will even intern overseas. Um, and we also want students to have fun. So when you're not in class and when you're not working that internship, we do have over 600 different clubs and organizations for you to choose from. Um, and some popular ones include Greek life. So we do have Panhellenic and um, interfraternity council sororities and fraternities. Uh, we also have a really great student government, which puts on the nation's largest uh, student run carnival, Spring Fling. Uh, so that's another fun way to get involved on campus. And then pretty much anything you can think of in terms of a cultural interest, religious, political, uh, social, maybe you love um, trivia or Harry Potter, really anything you can think of, chances are we have a club. And if we don't have it, you can create it because all of our clubs are student created. And in addition to all of the clubs and organizations, we have quite a few support services on campus for our students. Um, so one in particular that we're very proud of is called the SALT Center. Uh, so SALT stands for Strategic Alternative Learning Techniques. And this is a program on campus for students with learning and attention differences. Um, if you are part of this program, not only do you have access to the physical building on campus, um, but you will have a learning specialist that you will meet with one-on-one -on -one once a week. You will have exclusive access to SALT Center tutors. And if you have um, testing accommodations that you need or any other accommodations, the SALT Center works with our students um, to liaise with the Disability Resource Center, which is another support service that we have on campus. Um, another one that is quite popular, aside from medical services and counseling and psychological services, we do have something called SOS, which stands for Support Opportunity Success. And you can text them, you can call, you can email, and it's not just for students, it's also for parents. And that's something that you can use if you have questions about policy, um, maybe you want to know when you can drop a class or add a class, really anything that you can think of, they are there to help. Um, so definitely take advantage of all of those resources on campus. Um, okay, you look great in red and blue. Um, I don't know if you can tell that I'm wearing blue, um, but we take our school spirit very seriously. We are very proud of our teams. Uh, we are a division one school for 15 different sports. We're part of the Pac-12 conference, so we play other big name schools like Stanford, UCLA, uh, Berkeley. So if you're looking for that big game day experience, that is definitely something that we have to offer. Um, one of my favorite things every Friday before a football game, um, we do have parades down University Avenue, which is the street closest to campus. Um, and everyone's out there supporting the team. You really can't go anywhere in Tucson uh, without running into a fellow student or a professor, or someone that is cheering on our teams. Um, other things to keep in mind. So housing, a lot of students think that it's mandatory to live in the dorms their freshman year. Um, at Arizona, it is optional. So you do not have to live on the dorms if you, in the dorms if you don't want to. However, we do find that the majority of our freshmen do live on campus that first year. And studies show that students tend to perform better in classes when they are living on campus. It's also very convenient because you've got your food, your um, medical services, pretty much all of those support services that I talked about are very easily accessible if you are living on campus. And we do recognize that students have different living preferences. So we have dorms that range in size from under 100 students all the way to about 800 students per dorm building. We have themed living communities. We have different bathroom styles. If you want to share a bathroom with two students as opposed to the whole floor, um, suite style living, there are themed living communities. So a lot of choices for you to check out. Um, and if you want more information, definitely go to housing.arizona.edu and you can also tour all of the various dorms. Um, so moving on, this is our newest dorm, is also where our Honors College is housed. So this building was finished uh, fall of 2019. And the Honors Village not only has dorms, but it also has apartments for students who want to live on campus all four years. Um, there is a dining commons there, which is accessible to all students on campus. And right across the street from this building, there's a brand new gym, which is also available to all students. 
If you are interested in applying to the Honors College, um, benefits that come with being an honor student, you're gonna have smaller classes, you are gonna get priority class registration, um, exclusive access to honors only internships and opportunities, and it's a really great way to customize your education. If there's something specific that you wanna study, you can work with professors to kind of create your own courses. Um, so if you're interested in the Honors College, there is a separate application, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that um, later. Um, moving on, so Tucson is where the University of Arizona is located, and here you can see a picture of Mount Lemmon. This is a little less than an hour away from campus, um, so if you are a hiking, biking, outdoorsy kind of person, we have students that will go on outdoor adventure trips here. Um, if you like to hike or bike, there are plenty of trails for you to do so. Or if you're like me and you like to try new restaurants, um, the Tucson has the nation's best 23 miles of Mexican food. Uh, the last time I was in Tucson, I had uh, Mexican food at uh, El Tumerico, which is a vegan restaurant. So there are options um, for any kind of diet, lots of really great places to explore. Um, and my favorite place uh, is downtown Tucson. So this is very easily accessible via streetcar. So you can take the streetcar from campus. It's about two miles. Um, if it's the winter time or evening and it's not too warm, it's a very easy walk. Um, that's typically what I will do. And not only are there really great restaurants here, but there are shops and boutiques. Um, and it's a very popular spot for students to hang out um, if they're not hanging out on campus already. Um, so let's talk about tuition. Uh, so the University of Arizona uh, out-of-state tuition is roughly around $36,000 per year, not including room and board. Um, but one thing that we offer that not all universities have is a guaranteed tuition plan. Uh, so what this means is the price that you pay as a freshman is the same price that you're going to pay for four consecutive years. Uh, so if you enter the university and tuition increases but you're already a student, you will not be impacted by that. And we know that college is expensive, so it's nice to know this one number, this is what I will be paying for four years. Um, another thing to keep in mind, 85% of our students re receive some form of financial aid, whether that's a grant, a loan, or a scholarship. So there are lots of opportunities there. And one that I'll talk about right now for out-of-state students specifically is called the Arizona Tuition Award. All you need to do to apply for the Arizona Tuition Award is submit your application to the University of Arizona. Um, and in the past, we have required test scores for the highest scholarship amounts. Um, this chart is what students were offered uh, for this fall 2020. This is also the chart that we've used for the past few years. Um, I'm not entirely sure how it will change, um, given the fact that a lot of you, I'm sure, have had a lot of difficulty being able to take the exams due to the pandemic. Um, so be sure to check our website um, later in the fall for the most updated chart. Um, but just know that our senior leadership, they are working to try to make um, a new tuition structure that is equitable for students. Um, but one thing to keep in mind historically, the information you see here, um, if you have an unweighted GPA of a 3.25 or higher, um, you would automatically receive some form of scholarship money, even if you had never taken the ACT or SAT. Um, and these scholarship amounts are awarded per year. Um, so talking about our application, if you are going to be a senior this year, our application is actually going to be opening very soon. It opens on August 1st and you can apply on our website or you can use the common application or the coalition. It really doesn't matter which one. It's the same application, just three different ways to access it. And on our application, we are going to be looking at your grades in these courses, the rigor of courses that you've taken. So we look at honors and AP courses, IB, all of that, as well as your overall grade trends throughout high school. Um, because we recognize that you are more than just a number, you were more than just your grades, tell us about your extracurriculars. So anything that you're involved in, in your community, your high school, um, maybe you taught yourself how to play the guitar or foster kittens, whatever it is we wanna know. Um, another thing to keep in mind about our application, we are essay optional, and I really do mean that. You do not have to write an essay, but if you want to, you can, and you have 500 words. 
to tell us whatever it is that you'd like to share. Um, and historically, we have been a test optional school. So even prior to the pandemic, um, you can be admitted to the University of Arizona without ever having taken the ACT or SAT. In the past, um, the only exceptions to that would be the Honors College as well as Engineering and Nursing. Um, however, they are in talks to see how this might be modified for this coming fall. Um, so that's kind of our structure. And then once you submit your application, um, submit those scores if they're needed and pay your application fee or request a fee waiver, uh, you will receive an admissions decision in two to four weeks. Um, so rolling admissions is really great in that way that you do have a very long period of time to apply and you will hear back from us um, rather quickly. And then if you ever have any questions, um, we have a virtual visit page where not only can you take a virtual visit of our tour, but we do have daily info sessions. Some of them are college specific. So if you're interested in the business school or engineering, um, some of them have to do with programs like uh, ROTC. Uh, so definitely check out that website. You can also register for one-on-one -on -one, um, video conference appointments. So if you wanna speak to me, you wanna have a video appointment, you can schedule that. Um, and that's the end of my slides. So I am going to hand it on over uh, to Reed and have Million present. So thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. I appreciate it. And uh, excellent. So uh, good. Uh, morning for most of us, almost afternoon. My name is Million Trulove. I'm the Vice President, Dean of Admission and Financial Aid. Uh, and today, I'm going to spend uh, some time talking about uh, giving an overview of Reed, um, talking a little bit about life at Reed, and then also talking um, about how you apply to Reed for admission. Um, and I am going to just uh, walk through a few of my slides with you. Uh, one of um, the great things about our campus is that uh, we're located in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest. This is a great um, overview of our campus um, right beyond Portland. You'll see Mount Hood, uh, the snow-covered mountain right in the middle top of your screen. Uh, but we are a campus of about uh, 1,400 students. So each year we welcome um, just over 400 first-year students and transfer students to our school. Uh, we are a national liberal arts college. Uh, and uh, this is a, a special place uh, where learning uh, usually happens and really takes place. Um, this is a, a diverse community. Um, this is a place um, that uh, is known to um, actually draw students from the farthest on average than any other college. So you'll get students from every country, I'm sorry, from 40 countries and you'll get students from every state. Uh, but it's really neat that you'll be on campus and you'll have so many experiences. We really think that enhances uh, the academic classroom. Uh, we're a private school that's culturally diverse. We're a private school where about 15% of our students are international students. Uh, all of this makes for a really strong learning environment. And uh, again, looking the other way for camp from campus, you'll see we're about 15 minutes from downtown Portland. Uh, you can bike there or you can certainly uh, take the light rail. Um, right on our campus proper, we have uh, over 100 acres right in the middle of Portland. Uh, this is a bridge that goes over uh, the Reed Canyon, um, which is actually a waterway um, and it's the largest um, clean water body within Portland city limits. Um, and this is a place where in our environmental study majors uh, do lots of, uh, of their research, but it's also a place for relaxing. Um, there are walkways, there's running paths, um, and this is how students get to and from classes on our campus. And uh, it's a pretty special place, and this is our main hall. Um, this is Elliott Hall. And this is just an example of the architecture that you'll find uh, here on campus. So what type of students usually end up looking at Reed? Uh, one of the things I talked to um, high school counselors about is um, that student who is sitting in their office and that counselor is so engaged with that conversation uh, that they look up and they realize passing time is gone. Um, but because of that engaged conversation, they had no idea, so they have to write them a pass and get them off to the next class. Um, but if that sounds like you, someone who um, finds yourself back in a teacher's office because they've mentioned something that's so interesting, you went home, you did a little bit of research, and you found out some more, and you wanted to come back 
and talk to the teacher or professor about that particular topic. If that sounds like you, you might be a really good fit for Reed. Uh, Reed is a place where students live uh, the life of the mind. Uh, they lo love to learn. And in fact, uh, we're a national leader for producing students who go on to get their PhD. Uh, there are only three places uh, that do better. Um, Caltech, MIT, and Swarthmore, and we move back and forth with Swarthmore, but these schools produce more PhDs per capita than every other school in the United States, and that's 4,000 schools in the United States. And what I like to say, and I truly believe this, if you do well at Reed, you will do well anywhere. Um, we are often recognized as a school that walked away from U.S. News and World Report rankings. Uh, when U.S. News World Report first opened, Reed was number 10 on their very first list. And we decided several years ago that um, U.S. News and World Report did not have the same values that we did, um, that indeed it was more important to, for us to focus on the development of students. And so we've walked away um, from reporting in U.S. News and World Report, and even though we realize a penalty, our goal is to educate students and educate you and help you figure out if this is a place where you can be for four years. And if it is, it's going to be a place where you develop and grow and you can be assured success. Um, our students come in and they take a shared course. It's called Humanities 110. Uh, this is a humanities course that focuses on different eras of civilization from ancient Greek all the way to the Harlem Renaissance. And all of our students take a shared class together uh, where they engage in a lecture and those lectures are broken up into individual conferences where students are in a classroom with anywhere from eight to 16 other students with a faculty member uh, talking about their readings, about conferences, uh, and it's a learning experience that's really led and guided with both students and faculty members being in partnership. Uh, one of the really special things about HUME 110 is something called the essay conference. Uh, our paper conference, when you write a paper and get it back, um, you don't just get a paper that has uh, a, a, a grade on it, an A minus. Uh, when I got a paper, I took it, I turned it over to the back, I saw I had to grade a grade and I didn't have to think about it again. Uh, at Reed, you will not get that grade on your paper, but you'll get comments. And what you'll do is you'll actually sit down with your faculty member, with your professor, and you'll talk through your paper for one hour, one on one with your teacher. Um, it is, they mention things like, uh, you mentioned this in class, I'm not seeing this in your essay, or this is a great idea, I want you to run with it. This information is superfluous, you don't need this. But after that conference, you're more excited to go at that paper than you were when you first started. And that is a snapshot of the entire Reed uh, educational experience. It's one of the reasons why we can be so successful for sending students on to graduate school and success after they graduate. Um, our most uh, populous programs are English, biology, um, economics, psychology, um, but this is a really neat place because even things like uh, the linguistics major, which might have 10 students that graduate from linguistics a year, is still ranked number two in the nation for PhD production. So the size of the program has no bearing on the quality. You will be able to do as much and more in depth with every program. Um, as you would with um, what might be considered um, a larger program. Uh, in addition to that, you will merge your academic life with your social life. Um, so this is a student here who is actually um, managing our nuclear reactor. We have a research reactor on campus. Um, while that sounds super scary, it has about enough power to, um, to power a washing machine, uh, but the uh, techniques are still real. Um, it is very much, um, fission controlled and um, one of the neat things about our research nuclear research reactor is that we actually have more women who are research reactors than the entire United States has combined here on our campus uh, and I think that's really neat and this is a picture of our pool uh, you can see some of our uh, rods right in the middle that produce the power um, the incandescent glow is unique to the specific type um, of nuclear uh, ore that we use. Um, students can be involved in theater. Um, students can be involved in many events. So your life does not stop at the edge of the classroom, but it expands to other parts of campus. Uh, this is one of our students group, stu group, student groups. Uh, they are called Weapons of Mass Destruction, and they're a fire dancing group that performs several times a year. 
And for our student organizations, uh, students actually vote um, our top organizations to receive the most funding. And so while there's much autonomy in creating these organizations and you can design what you will, uh, there is still a responsibility to make sure that the organizations are successful in their offerings and what they can do and how they're keeping you entertained. Uh, another great part about our location, we're an hour and a half from the mountains, we're an hour and a half from the ocean. Um, this is Reed's cabin on Mount Hood. Uh, this is a cabin that's open for our faculty, staff, and students. Uh, you can go up and you can ski, you can hang out, you can chill, um, but it's one of the really cool amenities, amenities that's offered on campus uh, in addition to being able to check out uh, gear so you can go out hiking. Uh, it's one of those great zones where, you know, you drive a half hour beyond Mount Hood and you're in the desert. Um, so it's a play, great place where you can actually engage in your environment in a really special way. Um, this is an active campus. Uh, one of the really unique and neat things about our campus is also that all of our activities are all inclusive. Um, if we have a club and organization. Uh, you can participate. This is not a place where we say no. Um, but that also means that we actually don't have any NCAA uh, division, NCAA uh, sports. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't play sports and you can't be active. We actually have a basketball team um, and we have a soccer team. They finished second in their competition. Uh, but these are organizations where if you want to participate, you will participate. And that's something, again, that's very unique uh, about our ethos. Um, it doesn't prevent athletes from attending. In fact, about half of our students in any given year are vers varsity athletes. So these are students who still find ways to stay fit and to be active, uh, but also are really enjoying their experience uh, inside and outside of the classroom. Um, there are a lot of places, uh, a lot of ways in which you can engage your community. Um, for example, we have several residential halls on campus, actually over 20 residential halls for a small place. These are residential halls that are designed to be community building, Thing, but also are somewhat small in nature. Um, and about 70 uh, to 80% of our students live on campus. Uh, the remaining students tend to live somewhere in Portland. Uh, but you can live in a residential hall. You can also live in places like our garden house, which is a theme housing for folks who are interested in environmental studies. Um, you can live in one of our language houses, whether it's the French house or the German house. Uh, but you have many ways that you can design your living experience, including um, apartments and singles. And um, in fact, one of the things that we've done in response to COVID-19 this year is all students uh, will be living in a single this year. Um, we have about uh, capacity for about 80% of what our normal students would have here on campus. Um, but this fall, Reed is going to teach in person. Um, and our classes are offered in a hybrid model. So some classes will be in person, some classes will be online, and then some of our online classes will have an in-person component and some of our in-person classes will have an online component. Uh, it sounds really interesting, but what it means is that our first year students are guaranteed to have an in-person class. Um, it also means that if you have a class that's online but you wanna meet with your professor socially distanced, you can do that. There might be small meetings um, for socially distant group work, you may do that. Um, in addition to having um, uh, single use spaces, uh, we also are off bringing tents on campus. So there will be large tents for folks to learn outside, for folks to eat, where there's great ventilation and increased safety. Um, it's a place where we've been able to be really responsive to some of the changes to make sure our environments continue to be safe. Um, these residential halls, uh, particularly this year, are living and learning spaces. So our first year students will come in and they'll live in residential pods, which are groupings of about tw uh, 15 to 20 students. And this year, um, in order to support this, the health and safety of students, these are gonna be connected with some of the classes that you have. So these living and learning models are known to increase social environments, uh, to increase safety, and also increase your likeliness to stick around because they're really enjoyable. And as you see in our residential halls, there's hangout spaces, there are kitchen spaces, but a variety of ways for you to engage. Um, and then in addition to that, um, another way that we combine social activities with learning is through Paideia. This is a week on campus where students can teach a topic of their interest. Um, and it's whatever you like. In fact, this is a question you're going to find on our application. What would you teach during Paideia? 
Uh, we ask that question because we know that um, when we ask the question, why would you want to come to read? Sometimes you couldn't answer that question because you hadn't been to read and maybe weren't happy because your answer sounded like uh, the website. Well, that's not completely fair because not everyone can get to campus. But one of the things we love is to hear about things that you're excited about. And when you share an area of a passion, like things you would like to teach your other community members here at Reed, we get excited too. And so this is a Paideia class where this student is um, teaching their local Hawaiian dance course. Um, but other classes like that are things you can talk about in your essay and then engage in once you're here. Um, Reed is a place, as I alluded to just a moment ago, that's um, supportive financially. Uh, we are need uh, sensitive in the admission process. Uh, we are one of 60 schools that fulfills 100% of your demonstrated need. So what you need, we will provide it for you. We are um, storied for our ability to, to offer exceptional financial aid and to be competitive. Um, but also there's value in our education. Um, our students go on to do amazing things. And that's one of the reasons why this is a place that can be supportive for students that have uh, need and students that don't have need. Um, this year for the application process, we are test blind for admission. We're one of seven national liberal arts schools that is going test blind or has been test blind. Uh, right before we went test blind, Caltech decided to do the same. Um, but because students have not been able to either sign up for the test, some students have been able to sign up but haven't been able to take the test twice. It has always been most important to us how you perform on that high school transcript and that's where we're going to spend most of our energy in the evaluation process. Um, so join, our, um, join any of our information sessions that we have on a weekly basis um, and that will be a great way that you learn about that process. Um, but we have a good number of our students who apply early decision because that tends to be more favorable for folks in the admission process. Um, but early action and regular decision are also great options. And you can use uh, the common application or the coalition application uh, to apply to read for both of those processes. Um, back in the good old days when we could be less socially distanced, uh, this is a picture of students um, after their orient pre-orientation program. One of the things we're committed to doing is bringing you in and helping you make community right away and feel comfortable and make friends and form deep relationships that will last uh, the rest of your life. Um, and as a result, I think our students go on to be not only really happy incoming students, but also extremely happy graduates. Uh, and I'll say in closing, uh, again, I'd love for you to come and spend some time um, viewing our events. We have um, about 10 to 20 virtual events uh, a week. And these are different events from essay writing workshops uh, to tips on navigating the selective college admission process to um, student hangouts and live tours. Uh, I promise you, you're gonna find something that's gonna be helpful and that you'll enjoy. And the information we provide is not just to help you navigate the Reed College admission process, but to help you navigate the admission process at every school. So I hope that you all take some time to come and join us uh, during either this week, the college application week, or some other time. And now I'm gonna pass it on uh, to Maxwell. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, and again, my name is Max. I'm one of our admissions counselors here at Montana State. Let's see if I can get this to, there we go. Uh, so I, I'm a counselor here at Montana State in Bozeman, and I wanna run through a couple things very similar to what we've covered already for our, our, our colleagues here, uh, talking a little bit about MSU in general. Uh, so I wanna talk about kind of like our campus profile. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about our community here on campus for students and our location in Bozeman, uh, then talk a bit about our academics, admission requirements, and then move into our uh, kind of next steps and scholarships, that sort of stuff. So starting off here, uh, I think it is important to mention that we are right now Montana's largest university. We're our oldest, uh, whoops, seems like it keeps wanting to advance here. There we go. Uh, we are Montana's oldest and largest uh, university. We're a public university. Uh, big for Montana, uh, but comfortably medium-sized when we look at the, uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. It looks like it wants to keep auto advancing, but uh, anyway, uh, when we look at it here, uh, we are mid-sized nationally. So total student enrollment for the fall of 2019 was 16,766 students. Uh, that puts us uh, kind of right in the middle of that stage nationally. And the majority of those students are undergraduate students. Uh, I think the, the big thing to note here 
for us as a university is we kind of do the best of, of kind of splitting uh, the benefits of larger and smaller universities. Uh, so we kind of, if you had to put it in a sentence, have the uh, perks, so to speak, the community and the support of a smaller school with the opportunities of a larger university. Uh, so what I mean by that is academically on the small side of things, you're going to be looking at uh, more kind of intimate academic spaces with average class sizes ranging around 30 students. Our student to faculty ratio is about 19 to 1 at this point. We can move on to that next slide at this point. Uh, and all of our students get things like individual academic advising, uh, inexpensive or free tutoring and support. So they're getting kind of the, the perks of a smaller community here on our campus. And for me as a student, that was really, really important because I'm someone who really needs that, that smaller environment. Uh, to work correctly uh, academically to be able to connect with my classmates and, and my faculty and that sort of stuff. So uh, we do kind of have those smaller school benefits, but at the same time, if we move on to the next slide, you're going to see some of those bigger school perks. Uh, one of the biggest for us comes down to our academic opportunities for students. Uh, background here, there are a lot of different colleges and universities that students can choose from in the U.S., uh, just over about 4,000 or so, uh, and there's lots of ways to classify them. And one of the most reputable groups for that is a group called the Carnegie Foundation, and they look at schools based on research activity. Uh, and when we look at that, uh, basically we are one of about 130 colleges and universities in the U.S. that's a top-tier research school. Uh, basically that means we are in the top three percent of schools when it comes to money we spend on research annually. Now, I remember when I heard that several years ago as an incoming student, I said, okay, that sounds really, really interesting, but what does that actually you know, bubble down to or boil down to at the end of the day for me as a student? And what we're talking about is, is providing our students with a hands-on based education. Uh, the whole idea is we want to make sure we're providing you with that practical kind of boots on the ground type of experience outside the classroom. Uh, now, if you're like me, when I was at MSU, I was a film student. Uh, when I first heard the word research, my brain kind of jumped to uh, a guy in a white lab coat over on our chemistry labs. And, and that's what some of our students will do. But for me, research specifically was being on a soundstage making a short film uh, or in the editing lab working on that film. For some of my classmates, that would be a design studio in our architecture program, uh, or working with a business here in Bozeman on a project. Uh, in my roommate's case, freshman year, he was a cell biology and neuroscience pre-med student that was working with human cadavers uh, in our cadaver lab on, on human dissection. So however it takes uh, form for your major, you're getting a hands-on experience. And the reason that I emphasize that is that's something that every student on our campus gets to take advantage of. Uh, because when we look at where our students kind of break down in our enrollment trends. The vast majority of our students on campus are undergraduate students. Typically at a larger research university, those research opportunities go to graduate students or seniors, whereas everybody who comes to MSU gets into those hands-on experiences right away their first day on campus. Uh, so when I came in as a film student, they were literally throwing a camera at me on my first day of school and saying, let's go to work, your first project's doing it, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. So we are ranked as a top tier research school, high undergraduate profile, and a high commitment to community engagement. So again, getting you to work with groups outside the classroom. So you're getting the small school academics along with the big school academics. And we'll show you some of the majors and colleges that we have here in a couple minutes. Now, talking about our campus demographics, other big picture stuff here, you can see a breakdown of our incoming class from fall 2019, the most recent one, uh, almost right down the middle, 50-50. About half our students are coming from out of state, the rest are coming from across Montana. And I can tell you personally that this was a really good balance for me as an individual, uh, because it was nice to know, frankly, that I wasn't the only student coming from a little bit farther away from Buffalo, New York. Even though I didn't know anybody when I got here, to know that there were students from California, Washington, Alaska, Texas, who might have that same situation uh, was really comforting. And that meant there were a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds that I got to meet when I got here. Uh, you can see our top 10 home states there on the far right. California is a pretty strong performer, usually at number four every single year. At this point, though, we have students from all 50 states and over 70 countries on our campus. So uh, I really appreciated that. It was something I honestly didn't expect coming to a medium-sized public school uh, in a state like Montana. But for me, that was really, really important. Uh, and that was something I really benefited from when I got here. Now, the other thing that's really important for our students, of course, is the community that we're located in, Bozeman, right? So you kind of saw a picture of the area on that opening slide, but if you, you're not familiar with the area, you haven't been here before, uh, we are in southwest Montana. 
about an hour, hour and a half north of Yellowstone National Park. About 60,000 people in the Bozeman community itself, um, which I think is, is really cool because it kind of gives our students the best of both worlds. For Montana, we're a bigger town, but for anywhere else in the country, we are decidedly a smaller college town. And you're kind of getting, much like with the university itself, perks from both sides of the aisle. So you have all the creature comforts. We're pretty easy to get to from a lot of places in the country, flying into Bozeman International Airport. Uh, we're located along major highways. We have bigger stores, like Target and Costco and all that sort of stuff. But we have a really, really tight-knit college community. And again, as somebody coming from a little bit farther away, I didn't really know what to expect when I moved to, to Bozeman, Montana, you know, 2,000 miles away from home. And to move to a town that bleeds blue and gold, or our school colors uh, was really, really cool. Uh, it didn't matter where I was coming from. If I went downtown as a student, uh, you would see that school support. You'd see the banners and the Bobcat stickers and flyers. You get discounts at shops downtown because you've got you know, a Bobcat sweatshirt on and you've got your student ID. You'd see 20,000 lunatics at the football stadium in the fall cheering on the Bobcats. So it shows up in a lot of different ways. But it's definitely one of those communities that really has that tight-knit college town vibe. Uh, and is very welcoming to students, whether they're coming 20 minutes up the highway or 20 hours across the country. Uh, the other big thing, of course, about Bozeman is our location, right? So I mentioned we're about an hour, hour and a half north of Yellowstone National Park, uh, and that means we have access to some incredible wilderness areas. So if you're somebody who's big into the outdoors, uh, I think the really cool thing is, yeah, Yellowstone's about an hour away, but 10 to 20 minutes from campus, you can find some incredibly cool stuff. Within 10 minutes of here, you'll find about 80 miles of trails that lead in and out of the Bozeman area uh, and connect us up to the mountains on either side of us. We call it our Main Street to the Mountains program and trail system. About 20 minutes away, you'll find Bridger Bowl, which is our community-owned ski area. Uh, some incredible terrain up there. Just under an hour, you'll find Big Sky Resort, one of the biggest ski resorts in North America. Uh, and then again, just over an hour, you'll find Yellowstone National Park. So as you look at this slide and you look at the next slide, you'll see there's lots of really, really cool stuff uh, in our community for students who like the outdoors. And this is stuff that I did not grow up with. We had some you know, nature trails and some kind of more rural areas around where I grew up, but we didn't have access to this sort of stuff growing up. So this for me was a big draw and is a big draw for a lot of our students every single year to have such incredible access right in the backyard. So if you're a student who likes to get active or you're a student who's looking at that, Bozeman can be a really good fit for you. So between everything that happens on our campus, Again, being a larger university for Montana means there's stuff going on, Division I athletic events, big concerts, guest speakers, theater performances, and then also having the community of Bozeman around you. This is a place that it's pretty hard to get bored. So if you are getting bored, come find me. We'll find something for you to do. Now, the other big aspect, of course, I want to talk about today will be the academic side of things. What do we offer and then what sort of support programs do we have? as well as the application process and scholarships. Now, MSU right now has over 250 academic programs that are available for our undergraduate students. And they're split into eight major colleges here. And you can see the breakdown kind of college by college as far as where our students usually study. Uh, now, you will note we do have many of our students enrolled in the engineering fields and science fields. So STEM is definitely a big focus here in MSU. But I think it's important to note that all of these programs receive really, really good education uh, opportunities uh, and initiatives for their students, right? We're not a school that says we're an engineering school and that's all we do. We have really good options for students across the board. And I can speak from personal experience on that one as a film and photo student. Uh, the other great thing about all of these programs that you'll find inside these colleges, they are open enrollment. Uh, so we do not, for example, tell our incoming students uh, hey, you have to apply into your major separately as a freshman. Uh, that is something that some schools will do based on limited seats or things like that. But if a student is admitted to MSU, as you'll see here in a few minutes, they can jump into any of these programs right away freshman year. And again, that was really important for me because I got to, got to basically get my hands into those programs right away as an incoming freshman and start working in my major related courses. Now, we do also offer an honors college experience for students. Uh, this is an additional academic program that students can look at and kind of stack on top of their major. If you're a student who maybe likes a little bit more of an academic challenge, but also that smaller academic experience, this could be a really good fit for you. Um, honors is kind of a more rigorous, uh, more intimate program that layers onto your major, offering things like smaller average class sizes. Again, our average on campus is about 30, the average in uh, an honors college course really goes about 15 or 16 students. Uh, more seminar-based discussion, 
uh, courses taught by faculty from across campus. Uh, so some really cool opportunities. And this program, as I mentioned, layers on top of your major. So along the way, for example, if you're a chemistry student, you're going to take honors chemistry along the way and have account for your major. So you get to kind of immerse yourself in both worlds. And at the end of the day, you also earn uh, two diplomas. So you earn your honors baccalaureate degree along with your MSE bachelor's degree. So again, I think this is a nice balance for those students who are looking for maybe the opportunities of a larger public university, but the kind of more attentiveness of a smaller university, public or private. And this is also every year as we look at the next slide, uh, where we see our top scholars come out. Uh, we have incredible students every single year come out with major national scholarships and international scholarships. We're actually tied ninth in the nation right now for the Goldwater Scholarship, which is basically the top program out there, top scholarship for STEM schools and STEM students uh, in the company of some incredibly cool schools you can see on the list there, including places like Johns Hopkins, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, uh, not too bad for a school from Montana. So for students who are looking for those academic opportunities, the Honors College can be a really, really good experience. Speaking of academic opportunities, looking at the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about our admission requirements. Uh, now, uh, this is something, of course, that's a little bit different for each school. At MSU, uh, we function on what's called rolling admission. And if you're not familiar with that term, that means that we actually don't have a hard set start or end date to when our students need to apply for admission. Uh, so if you are a rising senior, going to be a senior this fall, uh, we actually, if you want to right now, you can apply. The application's open and it's something that you can take a look at. Now, uh, I would generally encourage students to apply sometime between uh, summer before their senior years, basically right now, through about the first half of senior year. So we're talking early to mid-December. The reason I recommend that, we don't have deadlines for admission, but some of our scholarship programs, which you'll see here in a minute, do. Uh, and I think it's important to make sure you get your basis covered there. On the flip side of that, though, if you have, uh, you know, if, if you have applied early, let's say you applied this week or this month, we don't have a binding commitment date or binding acceptance date. So uh, if you say apply August before senior year starts, we're not going to ask you to lock in by November or December or March or anything like that. Now, it's one application for the entire university. So again, you don't have to fill out a separate uh, uh, application for your different programs out there. The only exception, of course, being the Honors College. We also don't require supporting materials, so that means no essays, no letters of recommendation, and no transcripts. That's also why our application takes very little time to fill out. We're talking about usually 20 minutes at most, and we will generally turn those applications around in about two weeks, so you hear back from us very quickly. Uh, looking at that then, the question we always get is, what do you need to get into Montana State? And right now, uh, our admission requirements, you can see them in the green boxes there. Uh, we're looking for one of four things. Uh, essentially, it's going to be a 22 or better on the ACT, an 11, 20 or better on the SAT, a 2.5 or better high school GPA, or a rank in the top half of your graduating class. If any one of those four, unofficially, Welcome to MSU, we just need a little bit of paperwork. Uh, and those are statewide standards that are set to make sure that MSU stays accessible. Now, you can see on the right side of the screen are incoming uh, averages for students, uh, but as long as you have one of those four, you are good to go with us. Uh, a note specifically here for my rising seniors, especially in light of what's going on with COVID-19, uh, we actually have for the incoming class of 2021, uh, waived the test score requirement for the application. Uh, we are not requiring test scores uh, from the SAT or ACT to admit students. So if you haven't had the opportunity to take that exam yet, and maybe won't for a while going forward, please know that you can still apply for admission without those test scores. Uh, we are still strongly encouraging students to take those exams though, uh, because as you'll see as we talk about scholarships here in a minute, uh, we are still using those currently for scholarship consideration. But as long as you have one of those four and graduate from high school, don't forget that part. That's what the other boxes on screen talk about. You are good to go with us. Now, speaking of scholarships, as we look at the next slide, there's a couple different programs I want to talk about for you. Uh, the two big ones that our office helps offer for out-of-state students will be what we call Achievement Awards and then the Western Undergraduate Exchange or RUI Scholarship. Uh, now, average cost or total cost right now for a student looking at coming to MSU from out of state, uh, the most they can expect to pay usually is about thirty-eight to thirty-nine thousand dollars per year. That includes tuition fees, housing, book supplies, and their meal plan. Uh, but about seventy percent of our incoming students right now have some sort of financial assistance. And two of the programs that make a lot of that possible for students will be the ones you see on screen here: the Achievement Award Program 
is a tuition waiver program that awards up to $15,000 per year renewable to students. And it's based on two things. It's based on your GPA and your SAT or ACT score. As soon as we have those on file, we automatically consider students for this program. You don't have to do any sort of separate work to be considered. Uh, please note that this is also not time sensitive. So maybe you're a student who's in the boat where you're gonna apply you know, this summer, but you won't have your test scores maybe until November. That's okay. As soon as we get them on file, we will consider you for that program. It's not major specific or anything like that. So just automatic consideration of those two numbers. The Western Undergraduate Exchange or WUI program is fairly similar. Uh, it is also a tuition waiver program. It awards up to $16,600 per year renewable for four years. So it's one of our best merit scholarships on campus. Uh, this does also look at your GPA and test scores. So it's important to note that it's not guaranteed to every student from the WUI state. Um, we do look at GPA and test score. We're still setting those parameters for fall 2021. We expect them to look pretty similar to this past year though. Uh, to can be considered this past year, you needed a 3.3 or better high school GPA, and then a 27 on the ACT or a 1260 on the SAT. So stay tuned on those for any students who apply for admission, we'll send the new scholarship information in your packets when you get them. Uh, but these two programs are two of our largest for our incoming students as far as what they can be considered for. And again, neither is major specific and right now neither is time sensitive. A couple other programs to talk about as we go forward. The Presidential Scholarship, this is our best scholarship on campus. When we were talking about the Honors College a few minutes ago, uh, they are looking for those well-rounded students as they are the ones who offer this program. It's a full tuition waiver and a generous housing stipend. For students who are interested in that, the application opens in September. We recommend submitting it no later than the first Friday in December because that's the priority deadline. Uh, and it does ask for essays, letters of recommendation, counselor support, all of that sort of stuff. So again, strong academics, and then well-rounded outside the classroom through leadership experience, academics, uh, athletics, uh, jobs, community service, all of that sort of stuff. A couple other things to note with scholarships, all of our academic departments do offer scholarships to their students. So if you're an engineering student, for example, there's things that you can look at and apply for. Uh, generally, this is something that you can stack on top of your award from us here at MSU. You do apply to them separately. And again, we'll send information on what that looks like in your uh, academic packet for your acceptance packet. We also can work with outside scholarships. So we're talking about local community scholarships, maybe something your school gives out or a business. As long as those don't require you to go someplace else, you can stack those on top of your awards here as well. Uh, so very modular when you're looking at scholarships on our campus. And then last but certainly not least financially, we of course do work with uh, the FAFSA, right, the Application for Federal Student Aid, uh, for grants and loans and work-study jobs. We don't require this, so students are not required to fill this out. Uh, you can qualify for those other scholarships without ever touching FAFSA, but we do encourage students to fill out FAFSA to see what they might be considered for and because they can use the programs together. Priority submission date for that is going to be October 1st. Uh, we recommend submitting that December, by December 1st, so it opens October 1. We recommend having it by December 1. Um, so ultimately, when you're looking at the financial side of things, lots of things to keep in mind as far as dates and deadlines, but many, many programs that our students can take a look at. And closing it out kind of with those next steps, uh, when you look on screen here, there's several different things we recommend. We've talked about several of them as far as steps one through four. Uh, we do also have the live on requirement for our incoming students in the residence halls. To learn more about housing, meal plans, campus in general, what we really encourage students to do as they're looking at MSU is to learn more about us and do a visit, whether that's in person or virtual. With everything going on right now, uh, we are offering a limited number of on campus in person visits. Uh, what we recommend doing is touching base with our office to see what might be available, but we are offering every weekday virtual appointments. One-on-one uh, -on -one with our counselors, with staff from across campus, with our academic colleges, with housing, all of this sort of stuff. So this is something I really encourage students to do because I didn't get to do it as a student. I never got to see our campus before I got here or connect with anybody face-to-face. -face. And that's something we're really always happy to do for students. Uh, and you can learn more about that by going to our website at just montana.edu. We have a little bit more info there. So that is a very quick run through on MSU. And I think at this point, we're moving into the Q&A period. 
Wow. Thank you guys. Um, Max, Million, and Molly. Um, I'm going to go through my quick four slides here. This is not the first time the students have seen it, so <laughs> I don't need to spend much time on it. As I say, every single time I do this, every, every Tuesday, I just want to go back to college. And I want to go back to all of the colleges for like a month and just spend a month at each college and then that call that a college degree at the end of, you know, however, four years. So how cool would that be? Somebody needs to create that kind of college experience where I get to spend a month at Arizona, a month in Montana, a month in Portland, Oregon, and then I get to go to New York for a month and a month in Florida. And at the end of all of those months, I get a four year degree. <laughs> um, work on that. <laughs> See if one of you guys can create that type of university. <laughs> um, so really quick, I'm going to go over my services once again. Remember the masterclass for those of you who are interested is the least expensive way um, to get this uh, independent college um, consulting. You're working with a group of your peers. We do a once a month live um, Facebook session. We go over the important deadlines, as Max was saying, um, that need to happen for whatever is occurring during that application process. Um, you'll have um, some proprietary tools to use in order to get your um, your essays done. So, you know, once you've set up your guided path account and you put your colleges in, you'll be able to see um, what the essay requirements are from each of the universities, if there are any, and you can start working on those things. Um, so, you know, th that is that is an option. Also, for any of my um, underclassmen that haven't, um, you know, if you're a sophomore or freshman, we can get started on doing these things um, in a more relaxed mode rather than, you know, coming in senior year and, and stressing to get all of the application stuff done. So we set your account up, we get it going, and we um, work on all of the various aspects of um, trying to figure out um, what you want to do. As you heard from the majority of the pres presenters today, um, I don't think anyone um, discussed um, having to declare a major um, the, uh, at any of these institutions. You know, some schools do require that, um, but that's what that interest profile assessment is. And we figure out, well, you know, what are you good at? What do you what do you do that comes naturally? Um, working on your academic resume, um, you know, start to think about who's going to give you that letter of recommendation if it's um, required. Um, as you can see, school costs money, um, so we start to financially plan. You know, what does that look like? Like where are, you know, with the scores that you have and the grades that you have, what are you going to qualify for and the merit aid? Um, do you know, do we need to start thinking about other ways of um, financing that education? Um, prepping for standardized tests, that's all up in the air right now, as everyone knows. So um, those are things that unfortunately I don't have the answers to. Uh, but, you know, if eventually I think they're going to come back. Um, and I don't think they're going to go away forever and, uh, by any, by all institutions. As much as I think that would be a great way to move, but you can see that a lot of merit aid is attached to, um, to that. So there, a lot of schools are not requiring it for admission, but they are seeing that, um, we are seeing that they still are requiring it for, you know, um, being in an honors college or, or getting merit aid. So um, this is, you know, the comprehensive packages that I have for my um, upperclassmen. Once again, they already know all about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. And last but not least, here is all of our contact information. So make sure you take a screenshot of this or write down this information. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open it up to Q&A now. Um, so I had some questions that came in before. So it's one of the things that I ask if you have any questions that want to be answered during the presentation. So I'm going to start with those as our um, attendees, you know, start to type things into the Q&A because right now I don't see any Q&A questions in our boxes. So that means you three did an amazing job answering all the questions and you, there are none, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the ones that came in beforehand. Um, uh, I know the answer already for two, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. So applying for fall of 2020, will applying EA or ED as opposed to RD increase admission probability, um, admission acceptance rates for early action, um, early decision, and rolling decision? So I remember Molly and Max saying that you are both on rolling admissions, correct? So that would not affect anything for, for you two. So I guess, Millian, the question is for you. <laughs> yeah. So was the question if it'll increase your chances of admission? Yes. 
Oh, yeah, good question. Yeah, early decision doesn't, um, let me say it differently. Um, there's a higher acceptance rate for students to apply early decision. And okay. so I think, I think uh, Reed is not atypical in that way. Um, I think for students, it's a way to signal that this is a school that they really like. And, and um, it's sort of interesting, students who are planning early and apply early also tend to have done their homework early and tend to be really good students. So there is some correlation. So while the profile tends to be about the same as admitted students, yes, um, it's much more favorable in early decision. Okay. All right, great. Um, the next one was, do you use demonstrated interest when reviewing applications? So I just talked about this earlier today. Um, so NACAC does a survey and they ask a lot of schools, do you use demonstrated interest? And one of the things you'll see is that it's dropped from 23 to 9% in the last decade. And um, I question that. I think um, colleges are savvy enough to know that high school counselors and, and counselors who support college applications don't like that. Uh, I think it's still heavily used. I think early decision is the finest demonstration of demonstrated interest. And so while they might not signal that, I, I do think it's a thing, it's a thing for us. Uh, the way in which you weight it is different from place to place, but um, it's why when you go to campus to visit a friend, you also stop by the admission office and let them know that you're there. Yeah, I, I would say um, officially we, we do keep track of demonstrated interest, but it's not going to hurt a student's chances if they're not coming to campus to take a tour or if they're not emailing me. Um, more of these resources, they are meant to assist the student, make sure that we are answering the questions the students and families have. Um, so if you do have questions and you want to make an appointment with me, that's great. Um, and we definitely will keep track of that, but it's not required. It's not going to harm your admission. It can only um, help you. I would echo to a degree for MSU, kind of what Molly said as far as we keep track of it. But at MSU, it's not going to impact a student's decision on our end at all. Uh, those admission requirements, I know I went through them really, really quickly, but if a student meets them, they are admitted. There's no questions asked. It's not a, a waiting list situation or we have a certain number we bring in. If a student meets our requirements, we will be able to admit them without issue or without question. Uh, so we use it to kind of gauge kind of what's working for us and maybe what our students are looking for from us, uh, but we don't use it to impact the decision one way or another. Okay, great. Um... And I think this was answered during the presentations, but maybe if we can address it again. Does the major I indicate on my application impact my chances of being offered admission? At MSU, it does not. Um, okay. We just use that kind of as an indicator to place them in the right orientation session. And if they change their mind, if the student says, I marked down civil engineering, but now I want to do business, that's totally fine. It's a phone call or an email to us and we'll change it. So no impact for us. Okay, great. Arizona, um, I would say the only exception of it maybe being more difficult to get into um, would be engineering and our College of Fine Arts. Some of our programs, they do require auditions. Um, so musical theater, dance, those are very competitive. Um, however, if you are applying to a program that's competitive, not impacted, um, we don't have impaction at Arizona, that's a California problem. Um, <laughs> if you're applying to one of those competitive programs, we do require you to put down a second choice major. Um, so I do see a fair amount of students that they apply to engineering and they're not admitted to engineering, but they're admitted to their second choice major. Um, so even if you're not successful in being admitted to your first choice program, that doesn't mean that you'll be out of the running for consideration. And another thing to keep in mind, quite a few students who aren't admitted to engineering initially, they do come to Arizona and they can transfer into that program um, really only after one semester. So if you take 12 units of relevant coursework and you do well at Arizona, um, you can transfer into programs that you might not have been admitted to in the first place. Um, and like Max said, um, changing your major, it's very simple. You can do that before you even come to campus. Okay, great. Your does have any bearing on it. I'm sorry? It doesn't have any bearing on your chances. Any bearing at all. Okay, that's great. Excellent. Um, and thank you, Molly, for um, indicating that the impacted majors is just a California issue. Um, because all the California students think that engineering, nursing, and all of those things that they want to do um, 
And I always tell them that's not an issue if you don't go to a California school. <laughs> if you go to a school outside of California, they're not impacted. So thank you for reiterating and, and making that a um, uh, uh, relevant uh, piece of information there. Um, okay, there's one here with regards to COVID. Um, with the impact of COVID, I think this one came from a parent. This sounds like a parent question, not a student question. Um, with the impact, of a co the impact of COVID, what are you seeing with regard to deferment of class of 2020 that could possibly impact the class of 2021? Are you guys seeing anything? Oh, I got we're you all seeing, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> we're seeing a, a, a fair number of students defer more than normal, but not to a completely unmanageable degree. Uh, at this point, we, we don't anticipate any effects on the 2021 class uh, because we, again, we kind of have that luxury right now where we don't have a ceiling. We don't have an upper limit on how many we can admit or bring in in a certain class. So we're going to keep an eye on it, but for us right now, no impact anticipated. Okay. Um, Arizona situation, very similar to Montana State. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, prior to the pandemic, we normally did not allow students to defer admission. So if they were admitted and they decided they didn't want to come to Arizona, they would have to reapply. Um, but because of the situation, we have allowed students to defer either a semester or a year. Um, and a new program that we announced uh, for our deferred students this year, it's called Wildcat Way Forward. And basically, they can take classes as a part-time student online at a discounted rate uh, during their deferral period before they come to campus um, in person. So that's a really great alternative for students who don't feel safe coming to campus and they're not ready to start full-time. Excellent. What is that called again, Molly? Um, it's called Wildcat Way Forward. And if you have any questions about it, um, definitely contact me. I believe that they've just launched the website, um, but for students who have been admitted, they should have access to it in their um, UA Future account, which is the portal um, where their application is accessible. Great, thank you. So our, um, in general, we approve maybe about 50% of our deferrals um, and some years less, some years more, and it, and it really varies and it depends on the behavior of our, of our other students. Um, I think we've seen um, a lot more deferral behavior, but most of it seemed to be people hedging their bets in case we were online rather than in person. And so uh, now that we're in person, we're seeing a lot of families just simply decide to, to, to enroll in the fall. Um, I think there's a lot of regionality associated with deferrals. If you're in a spot where the cases are much greater, deferral seems like it's really needed. Um, for example, we have 7% of the cases that are in LA County. Uh, but if you're going, if you, and so there, there's sort of a regional, I think, um, uh, attitude towards whether or not folks are going to stick around. Um, I don't know what to expect for next year, to, to be really frank. I think many things are unknown. But um, I think as much as possible, we've tried to abide by our original policies because I think switching a lot makes it confusing for families. Okay, great. Um, the last one has to do with test optional and, and, um, and testing. Um, so I know you guys addressed all of that and, um, and talking about, and you know, Arizona has always been a test optional school. I know that, you know, Max, you said you are adopting it for 2021 and Million, you, um, you know, decided or not you decided solely, but um, Reed decided that they are going to go um, test blind. Um, so with that, uh, do you see having a greater impact in the, the, what factor of the application do you see having a greater impact on your admissions decision? I think what the question, I think the question is asking what parts of the application then are going to be taking that weighted percentage of where that test score was? Um, you know, is it going to go towards the essay or, you know, you know, I think that's what it's asking. I'll, I'll, I'll just start, um, so I'll, I'll refer back to the, some, some, um, the NACAC guidelines. They ask schools, what, what do they care about the most? And um, for the last decade, anywhere between 73 and 80% have said high school grades and transcript are the most important thing. 
uh, there, there's so much research out there that really affirms that that is a better indicator of success. And while the test score does give you data, the correlation with college success is just lower. It, it, there is some correlation, but it's just very low. Um, it has a high correlation of if people are gonna stick around or if they'll graduate in four years. So um, course selection within what's offered. Um, so I tell people, you know what the easy math class is. Um, take a challenging, rigorous load. And your admission counselor knows if you've taken an easier course or selection. I always encourage students to take four to five academic classes a year, math, science, social studies, uh, English, and foreign language. I think when you get um, below four, that's when you really start sacrificing the rigor uh, and perform well in those classes. Trends are important. And so um, I think in some ways the test score served only to hurt you. So if you were a straight A student and you had great test scores, you're good. And I, I'm talking about sort of just selective admission um, and environments. But if you had great grades and you had a low test score, it hurt you. But for us, you really do need to get great grades. I think maybe schools will believe that. And so I think schools will simply lean into that. There are so many pieces of the application that tell a story, the recommendation. Those are your advocates in the classroom that explain how you learn. And so there's still plenty of stuff there for us to have a good objective than this three hour test you take on a Saturday or this three hour test you couldn't take <laughs> the way in which you wanted to. Um, thank you, Milian. I always tell my students that I have something called a four five rule and it's um, all four years, all five academic core subjects. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you do that, you've set yourself up to apply wherever you want to go. So mm -hmm. four years of a math, four years of an English, social science, science, world language, you, you know, what, what did I miss? I know I missed something. English. <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> you take um, five, four, five year, I'm sorry, four years of all four, five core courses and you, you're good. You're good. And then you don't have to worry about what your course rigor looks like. And, and you, know, you know, take what you can do at your school that is, like you said, you, we all know what the easy math class is and we all know mm -hmm. what the harder math class is. So you mm -hmm. know what you're doing when you're making those decisions. Thank you. I'll just kind of pop in and say for Arizona, since we have been test optional for many years, um, in terms of replacing what we're going to be looking at more, that's not necessarily the case for us. Uh, we do a holistic review anyways. Uh, so we care about all the things that every other university cares about in the sense that we care about rigor and grades and overall grade trend. Uh, one piece of advice I always tell students, if you're concerned about your GPA, so if you were below the GPA average for the university, which is about a 3.5, unweighted, write the essay. The essay can only help you. It is not required, so you don't have to write it, but if you do write it, you're giving the admissions committee who's reviewing your application more of a reason to admit you. Um, so tell us something that's not already listed on your application. Thank you. Max? And for Montana, I would say again, because we, we've asked students to send us test scores, but we can make a decision off of any one of the four different requirements. It's not changing much for us on a review process at all. Uh, you know what I tell students every single year, I think we're a really, really good student school that's really, really good at meeting students where they are at. Um, for every valedictorian that comes from a really strong educational background with lots of support, we have a first generation college student from a rural part of Montana or another part of the country that did not have those services and supports available to them. So all across that curve, as long as a student meets one of the four, so you know, take the test scores out of the equation at all, they have the GPA or the class rank, they have a place at MSU. And even our students who maybe don't, maybe their GPA, they really struggled and they're, they're not at that 2.5, we can work with them conditionally on uh, provisional acceptance to help them target maybe subjects that are, are a challenge for them and work with them on those here at MSU. Um, so really for us, it's not gonna impact anything. My one caveat there and one piece of advice, still do well academically, obviously, for anybody else you're looking at, but especially with us, that's gonna help you out longer term in the scholarship realm uh, and financial aid realm for us. So we're designed to be a very accessible school admissions wise, but uh, that's no reason to not do your best on your academics when you can. Great. Thank you so much. I still don't see any questions in the Q&A. I, I don't know if we scared people off this week or um, 
or you guys, like I said, just did some amazing presentations where um, all the questions were asked. I think most of it, I think they're, they've gotten the gist of what I am doing every week. This is the sixth week that we've done it. Um, so they're, they're submitting the questions prior to knowing that I'm going to ask these first before we go to Q and A. So um, I think they're getting good at it. <laughs> so um, if there are no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to thank our presenters, um, Max, Molly, and Million, so much for um, giving of their, their time this morning um, and presenting to um, the students and parents um, here on the Central Coast. And if you have any questions, all, once again, all the contact information is on the screen. Um, I can say 100% that if you email any one of these three people who presented to you, they will email you back, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have been so giving of their time, um, so giving of information and willing to work with the students. And I always tell my students, schools are looking for reasons to admit you, not to not admit you. They, they are really truly find, trying to find a reason why um, you will be a good fit for them. So um, reach out, have the discussions, um, get the information and get it from the source, right? They're the source. Th these three people here on screen, they're your source um, and they're willing to talk to you. So um, any questions, um, you can reach out to me, to Molly, Million, or Max. Um, and if that's it, if I don't see another question pop up, I'm going to thank you all. And um, that's about it for today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank nice you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nyla. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.